A uh, quick reminder, don't forget to submit your lightning talks and vote for them uh, in the hall on the whiteboard. And Steph Walter will tell us about cockpit. Hi, guys. I'm here from the cockpit team, and we want to show you what we've built and how it works and why we've built it and uh, give you a lot of demos and experience about what's inside of it. I want you to feel like you're using Cockpit today and understand what it's about. So, Cockpit is a Linux admin interface. Cockpit is an interactive remote Linux admin interface. That's very important. It turns out about 15 years ago, people stopped plugging monitors into their servers. Right? <coughs> we, have, we have to be able to do that. I'll talk more about the interactive aspect later. Cockpit, when you log in, looks something like this. We'll get to see parts of Cockpit today, various bits and pieces, and, sh uh, and I hope you get a better understanding. But you can try this out. In fact, if the network is working, you can, you can do this on Fedora 21 as well. But the big question, the question we're going to start off today is why? Why did we build Cockpit? Cockpit, we have two goals, two main goals. One is to make Linux usable by non-experts by non-expert administrators, people who want to use Linux servers and Linux systems, Linux machines. And number two, to make the complex Linux features that we have in our platform discoverable by people. Both of these serve to kind of flatten the learning curve, make it really easy to get started. And then even, I'll show you how even the people here, developers and experts, will find use in Cockpit as well. Uh, I showed you something about this last year. But basically, we traditionally delivered Linux and distros as kind of a bag of parts, wheels, motors, engines. And we said, here, build your own truck. And you can build some pretty cool things with Linux. You can build really powerful trucks. <coughs> you can clone out Linux images, scale them broadly, virtualize them. You can containerize, run containers. <laughs> you can do things that you probably shouldn't, that somehow work for you, but everyone else is like, no, that's a bad idea. You can overload your trucks. You can make your servers, systems really sleek and fancy. And you can do it all wrong. But what if you just want to drive your server? What if you want to drive the systems? What are the options that you have today? Well, there's a, there's a few, but we want to make it so that out of the box, you can drive Linux. Windows Server has always been kind of drivable from the get-go. This is what you're faced with, with Linux. Now, for you and me, that hash prompt is ultimate power, endless possibilities. You see it, and you get a special feeling, right? I can conquer the world with a bash prompt. But for someone who doesn't know, uh, does not steeped in, is not an expert in all the commands that can be run from there, all the subsystems and the PIDs and the kernel and how you interact, how the state of the system, they don't have that model in their head. This looks like this. Completely intimidating and just a non-starter. They run away before they even start, right? So goal number one, make Linux usable by non-experts. Broaden the, the audience, the people who can use Linux. And um, more, more people, both, both commercially and, and uh, just trying it out. We expect people who get into Linux here then to become experts, right? What about goal number two? Oh, I'm going to demo goal number one. 
So, we all know how to change a host name. In fact, we probably all know 10 ways to change a host name on a system, right? But to someone who just seen that bash prompt, that shell root, doesn't. So I'm going to log into cockpit. Oh yeah, there's going to be lots of demos. Hello. There's going to be lots of demos today. And you're, you're welcome to point and laugh. Um, but also ask questions, right? So uh, feel free to interrupt. How do I change the host name? Trivial operation. Yep. It's, uh, it's, it's, already it's already really bad layout on this monitor. I can try. Let me see. Okay, well, you don't really get the full cockpit experience, but I'm going to go and, yeah, while we're doing these things, I can increase and then decrease the font size. So you just click on the host name. And you're done. Really? Oh. That is, okay, yeah, giggle. <laughs> Let me try logging out. There you go. <laughs> Magic. Yay! Okay, let's try this again. <coughs> so this is running git master of our stuff, so someone may have broken it. There we go. Woo! All right. Um, so anyway, it's a trivial operation, but someone at that bash prompt wouldn't have a clue, and they could just accomplish that. All right. Uh, where's my presentation? <laughs> this is pretty magical. There we go. Back, organize. Goal number two, make complex Linux features discoverable. So I want to make a network bond, and Typically, how does this work? You read some blog posts. Look at the trade-offs of using different tools. Download some tools onto your system. Look at the arguments, make a decision, right? Read some manual pages. Yes. Look for the one for your distro. And then you can finally run the command, right? And even though all of us are capable of that, do we really want to invest the time? We have so many things that are vying for our attention, right? So here I just click on networking, add a bond, select the interfaces I would like. You can choose a mode, of course, and stuff. I'm going to leave it at the default because that's the idea. Best practices are the default. And I have a bond. I can add an uh, address to it. I can, of course, reconfigure it and so on. So even for people who are experts steeped in Linux, this is a tool that helps them discover the more advanced stuff that we all have been working on together. Okay. But there's got to be a catch, right? For example, in order to be usable, you have to be usable out of the box. In order for people to use Cockpit to configure their systems, they shouldn't have to configure Cockpit first, as you saw me do earlier. Cockpit has to work straight up on your default install of your distro. And that puts a lot of requirements on it. And I'll show you how that works later. Um, but today, I'm going to give you a demo, Fedora. Fedora, here I have a, a freshly installed Fedora system. And when I run it the first time, no cheating here, right? Uh, 
No kickstart. This is an ISO straight from Get Fedora. Yeah. Let's wait for it. I, oh, I did choose a password. So let me connect to it. Now, if now I do have a self-signed certificate because I haven't configured the system at all. Uh, this is really honest. The first time I'm touching this system, and I log in. Now, this is an older version, as you see, older version of Cockpit, because that was what was delivered with Fedora 21. But nevertheless, usable out of the box. And to, to prove to you that this is actually the system, I'm going to shut it down, and it's not going to turn off my main machine. <laughs> <laughs> so I got disconnected. Well, let's take a look. The machine is gone, right? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoa. There's a word missing. Cockpit doesn't take over your machine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we heard Leonard talk in the previous talk before about these diva services. And these diva services own different parts of your machine, right? They've taken ownership of, for example, setting a host name, or the login, or to say the network, or various other things. Um, the containers that are running, if you, if you think about Docker. These services are the ones that have the state. They own the state of your machine, and they have APIs that you can configure um, the machine with. Cockpit has no configuration data. I mean, it does not store configuration data. Let's put it that way. It just doesn't. We call the APIs on the machine. And, and interact directly with them. Cockpit doesn't have its own access control, its own authorization, its own policy. Right? It, it is like as if you logged in over SSH. You get the same permissions. You get to maybe run sudo, maybe not. Um, and we respect all of that. To show you, I'm going to log into Cockpit. As a different user, I have a, a scruffy user. I'm, I'm back on the networking pad, and you can see we're not permitted. We actually asked Polkit whether the guy's allowed to do this, and we try to see if he can escalate privileges, and we find out he can't. So, um, and if we go, oops. yep. The system users. Yep. And, and a single sign-on and GSS API and all that goodness. I'll show you more about that later. Or I'll talk about that more later, actually. No reliable network here. But you can see, OK, so here I have a bash that's part of the cockpit session. You can see that we are logged in as Scruffy. Um, <coughs> I can see that there is a session from Scruffy that we started. and. You can see that here's the, here's the cockpit session. Here's the bash prompt. Here's the command I just executed. This is really exposing the stuff that you guys have worked on, the, the, the features and the, that system D has built, that network manager has built, that, that SSSD has built, that um, Docker has built for containers, for example. So we really respect the system. You're interacting directly with the system. You feel you're immersed in the system, graphs to show you the state of the system. And I'll show you more about this later. So. <coughs> Let's find my presentation. Cockpit reacts to the state of the server. We encourage you to outgrow Cockpit. Once you're, Cockpit cannot possibly have every option and every corner case and every flag covered by a UI button and toggle and whatever. There's always going to be cases where you need to go out. You need to use a script. You need to go to the console. You need to use a real management system, let's say. Um, and 
we react to the server. If the server changes, we can instantly update the UI. And this is important. We encourage you to use a terminal and cockpit at the same time if you need to. Do you want to see? Uh, now I get to screw around with this a bit. There we go. So, let's log back into cockpit. We'll go over to the containers page now. So you can see we have one container here running. I can actually, <coughs> I cannot. Let me stop it. Um, let me start a container, let's say. Let me start a new Fedora container and run bash in it. Okay. <coughs> there we are. And for example, if I now now we're in the container, let's say, and here you have the bash process, I'm gonna exit it. Right? And as I do, cockpit updates. It knows that the container has exited. Here's another example. I have three containers running. Right. Cockpit knows the container has started. You'll see this all the way throughout Cockpit. If a feature is not available in Cockpit, you can use another tool. Cockpit doesn't try to keep you inside of Cockpit, right? And this goes especially towards goal two. We're making advanced features discoverable, but then you can outgrow cockpit. All right. So, how do we build cockpit? Well, how does it do this? Here you can see an architecture diagram, if you like. So down at the bottom, you see a web interface, and that's really where everything happens. That's where your if statements and your while loops and your conditions and your all of that, all the, I, I, I don't want to say logic, because really the logic of configuring the system is in the system services, but all the UI logic, everything is there, driven from there. And we send messages to the system. We send dbus messages to the system. We send, uh, we open sockets on the system, and we send rest messages in some cases, for example, to Docker or to Kubernetes. And then we, we get information from the system, like metric information, what the CPU usage is, and so on. How do we do this? Well, it turns out to get an application into your browser, it has to be served. It doesn't just show up, right? So we have a small web server that delivers the application. The other thing it does, and that's Cockpit WS, is opens a WebSocket <coughs> over which all these messages flow that I talked about earlier. Cockpit WS also spawns a bridge, which is running in a user session as the user. It passes those messages through to it on its standard I.O. And it forwards Dbus messages. It does things like spawn processes on request of the web UI. And if you add multiple servers to your dashboard, let's say only one of your hosts is accessible directly um, due to a firewall or something like that, Cockpit WS will connect out using SSH to other hosts, spawn Cockpit Bridge in the SSH session that was created, and uh, do exactly the same stuff, right? Um, yeah, any questions about this? No, I, I, well, okay, so let's be clear. The APIs here are the ones by the system services all the way up there. Network Manager, System D, SSSD, those expose APIs. We can you, can you can look at one here, have one loaded. This is the time date D API. This is exactly the kind of stuff that Leonard was talking about. So it's the API for changing the time zone, starting this configuring NTP, and setting the time of the system. And so we transport that API to our web interface, and in theory, if someone wanted to, to work with us to share that transport and they're interested, uh, that's fine. I mean, you can talk Dbus directly, binary Dbus over, over SSH and over the network just fine, so it's not absolute necessity. The reason we do it in a JSON-style message format is because we're in a browser. <laughs> we're kind of limited, our options are limited. But, oops, 
find my slides again. Yeah. But the APIs are the part of the system. All of us together have been working on these APIs. We've been, work, we've been building this, whether we know it or not and whether we like it or not. That is why Cockpit can exist, right? Yep. Yes, and you can do that with any web UI that's in existence, right? Sure, and but again, if I log into a satellite interface, I can screw up all my servers or the same way. I mean, I'm not. It's not a. It's not a good or a bad thing. It just is, right? We, we rely, of course, on browser security, but again, remember, notice how Cockpit Bridge is running as the user. If you logged in as uh, non-root, non-privileged user, then you couldn't do that. So, there is there is remediation. Yep. Right. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna repeat the question. I forgot to do the earlier one. How, how, does, how are these SSH connections authenticated? When you, if you use Cockpit by a single sign-on, GSS API, we use that, we relay that, and, and use that for SSH. If you log into Cockpit with a password, we use the password to connect out. We expect that you log in and you're one user across those machines that you've added. Um, and if, uh, we don't have support for this yet, but we'd like to also be able to do public key auth. Um, to connect out. And that would, of course, be dependent on this machine that you connect to having those keys. All right, well, let's move on. Zero footprint. If you're going to be there out of the box in the default install, you have to have zero footprint. Your server is not there to run cockpit, turns out. It's there to serve applications, to serve users, to do stuff like that. And this is the same true of when you have multiple systems, one system. Cockpit has zero footprint. When it's not in use, it goes away completely and starts up when you access it. Exactly. Let's get this one. So I'm going to log out of Cockpit. Um, it goes away after 10 minutes, so I don't think you want to sit here. I'm going to stop it manually. And there are no cockpit processes running. If I connect, a cockpit, cockpit WS starts. And if I log in, you see a whole bunch more services, right? And so let's log out again. And you can see that that session went away. That other WS process, Cockpit WS, will go away after about 10 minutes. <coughs> so, um, yeah, okay, good question. We can go into details. So one bridge, actually, for certain operations, I logged in as my user, Steph, and I wanted to, we, we needed to escalate. We needed to run sudo. So we run another bridge as sudo Cockpit Bridge. Well, we use Polkit, PK exec. And then we pass, if I have permission to run root things, then yeah, Cockpit can use uh, sudo, essentially, to escalate privileges, run another bridge, and do root things. And we use that from the UI. There's actually options in our JavaScript API that specifies, oh, I want to do this thing as root, if possible. There's a question over here. Yeah, so um, the question is, how do we propagate errors that happen in the system back through? Well, APIs, it turns out d APIs like Dbus have error conditions as a first order message type. And so those come back just as signals, just as message calls and returns, those come back as those messages you see coming back from the bridge, coming back from the services, and then we display them. I mean, currently we, we are working on consistently not using dialogues to display them because I think that's bad UI. 
but we'd like to just, but that's, that's again, details, right? Um, fine tuning. Yes? We're actually working on that, um, but it's not about access to cockpit. It's whether you have access to do the things that you're doing through cockpit, right? Yeah, so I mean there's work being done on that, how to represent in IPA the ability to admin the local system. And yeah, we should, I can talk with you later, we can, Simo has some ideas and um, We haven't really planned it yet, but that's to my next point. Cockpit is pluggable and modifiable. And I want to give you a demo on how easy it is to add something to cockpit. So virtualization is, a, is of course, something that's missing. Another thing that's missing is setting the time zone. Turns out we didn't do that. <laughs> Oddly enough, I know this doesn't really, like, in scale, but yeah. So let's look at how we could do that. How could we add something to set the time zone? And this is just a de an example. I think we're going to refine this pluggability. <coughs> so here I've prepared one ahead of time, as they do. And I, there's blog posts and, and documentation on how to do this. There's guide about the APIs and stuff. So I'm just going to do it and show you. I'm going to link this so that I can edit it live into my, into my home folder. I think. And now, I'm going to log into Cockpit. And here on the Tools menu, you see Time Zone show up. OK? But let's look at how this is done. In here, there's two files. There's a manifest, which again, a boring JSON file. But let's, look at, uh, let's look at some code. This is a developer conference. Basic HTML. In this case, yeah, but there's ways, of course, to install it for all users. I can, yes. So this will only show up as the user that's, for the user that's logged in, because I linked it into my home directory. But there are ways of installing, of course, packages for all users too, so they show up for all users. And in fact, whole parts of Cockpit, in fact, soon all of Cockpit will be these, consist of these packages. So basic stuff, HTML input, and so not very interesting. But here you can see we have an API, <coughs> cockpit.dbus, which lets us open a connection by default to the system bus to that service, org.freedesktop.timedate1. Let's take a look at the API that we're calling. I want to set, call that set time zone method, and I want to access the time zone property to display the current one. So here we create a proxy. By default, time date D is a very simple service, so there's only one object, so it knows automatically which object we're talking about, but you can create proxies for different objects. And here you can say, you can see that we're displaying, we have a function called display zone. Whenever this proxy changes, we call display zone, and we access the proxy's time zone property, automatically populated using dbus introspection. And just shows up. Again, the same kind of thing's going on here. When this button, this is a button, is clicked, we call the change zone method. Change zone is here. Here we're getting the new value. Again, we're calling a dbus method right on the proxy. And we're handling failures. Now I want to show you something, how this works. So let's change the time zone. Change. You can see the time changed here too. Um, and of course, it changed here. Um, and now, what about if I do it from here? I hope I get this right. Yeah, there you go. Look at that. Let's go back to the code. Check out how this works. 
Notice that after we call the method, well, we're handling failures, sure, which goes back to your question. But we are not updating anything. Dbus signals notify us that the, the, the object has changed. That's the power of Dbus right there. This is how we're able to build Cockpit, build it so expressively and interactively. All right. Um, you guys probably, do you have a lot of questions? And I'll skip the other demo. You can, you can do things like spawn processes, and, and you can do things like interact with sockets. I mean, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. You can read files, you can replace files, you can monitor directories. And let, there's, a, there's a whole, it's all documented. But let's continue with a few more things about Cockpit. These are your features. Remember, Cockpit doesn't implement features. It makes them discoverable. It makes them approachable. It makes them usable, right? This is the stuff that is in Linux today, that we have delivered in distros, in RHEL. It's there. We're not, we're not, we're not trying to <laughs> build new stuff. Now, sometimes we go and we help the feature evolve, become appropriate for a user interface to consume it. And this, we've, we've sent patches to so many projects. We've helped them build Dbus interfaces. We've helped them uh, fix bugs. Turns out our continuous integration system catches tons of bugs in Fedora when people push stuff into updates without properly <laughs> checking it. But again, this is only possible because we all did this together. OK, I promised you I was going to explain the interactive aspect. Some configuration is declarative. You, s you plan out what you want to happen. Th these hosts over here are going to do this. They're going to get this image and this software. And these ones over here are going to do that, do something else. There can be thousands of them. And then you say, make it so. Stuff happens, hopefully not all at once. They report back. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way that you manage systems with satellite, with Puppet, with cloud forms, all these different things. Right? Cockpit, on the other hand, is interactive. You click a button, something happens. You're interacting with the system. You're on the system. The two are complementary use cases. In fact, you might move from one to the other and back for different tasks and use cases. Or maybe you start exploring Linux. You sp start exploring features with something interactive like Cockpit. And then you move on once you're comfortable to a declarative management system. And Sometimes it makes sense to embed some interactive task for a certain use case into maybe a, a bigger management console or, or a, another system. Those components that I talked about earlier, each of them are embeddable. I prepared a little example here. This may look like Cockpit, but it's not. This is Patternfly, and it's just an HTML file, or one of their demo. Patternfly is, a, is an effort to use consistent CSS, consistent buttons, consistent workflows and patterns throughout, across tons and tons of different projects. So it looks like you're using the same thing. Not everything fits in one project, so we need to make things consistent. But in this case, imagine this is a fancy management uh, console, but you might want to do one or two interactive tasks. And I've loaded here the journal from Cockpit. And this is live. Uh, let's load a terminal. So if I go like this, <coughs> it shows up here, right? If I, if I, of course, I can go into the terminal, do stuff. So if you, uh, and actually, yesterday at the Cockpit Hack Fest, which was really fun, someone took this terminal, Petter, took this terminal and put it into IPA. So you can go to the list of hosts and actually just bring up a terminal for it. I mean, it's a prototype. But because of single sign-on and because of pattern fly, you have no idea you're actually using something else, right? You perform an interactive task there, come back to the rest of the management console. Check that out. <laughs> That'll make some people happy. All right. <laughs> OK, last of all, Cockpit's not a product. I, I, I don't know if you remember, but when, I, when we started Cockpit on Fedora Server 21, it didn't say Cockpit. In fact, the only place you'll find Cockpit is in the About menu. 
Cockpit is the UI for that server, for that distro, for that thing. When Cockpit is part of Atomic Host, it, it'll say Atomic Host. It's the UI for that. In fact, the way that we're componentizing Cockpit allows different pieces of information, different pieces of UI to be present when you use it on different places. For example, OS tree is a fundamentally different way of updating your system than YUM. You have to have a different pane for that, different component. And that is totally, I mean, we're working on this, work in progress. Only parts of Cockpit are componentized right now, but we're working hard so that we can assemble it and deliver it appropriate to the various <coughs> OSs and distros. And we've just begun. There's lots more. Um, everything I showed you is real. I mean, that, that, that was not <laughs> just like some bullshit demo. <laughs> so, we have some time for questions, I think. A few minutes? Yeah? Um, I, do we have a, a module for Dev Assistant? And there, there was one that was being worked on, and uh, I think we just need to fine tune a few details. So yeah, it works. We needed to decide whether we wanted to do it in a VM or not, but I think just a few details. Yay. So, question, how do you get your subsystem into Cockpit? You came to the Hackfest yesterday, that's what you did. <laughs> but, so we had, we had a bunch of people trying out putting stuff into Cockpit, like I said, we showed you with a time zone thing. It's really easy to get started, start interacting. And what we'd like to see, Cockpit is design, right? When, when we build a feature, we look at what the use cases are and how the user would approach them, what kind of users are gonna interact with it and try and choose best practices and so on. But when we, First, we have to explore what's possible with those underlying services, right? So people are working on, um, there's probably three or four people currently working on exposing plugins, tools in Cockpit for various other uh, subsystems like, like uh, uh, crash management reporting or like roll, roll kit or like firewalls or different things like that. Of course, then, I'm, and it's really easy to make UI, given Patternfly and given the, the, the tools that Cockpit gives you. And then our, we probably would work with our designer to properly integrate some of these features so that they're in the right place in Cockpit and stuff like that. Next question. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the question is, what are we looking to add to Cockpit? Um, we want to make it easy to start with Atomic Host. That's one of the things. So that includes being able to use OS tree through Cockpit. Look at the rollback state, go forwards and backwards, right? Um, that includes um, exploring Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a great system that's, that's very complex and well-engineered, but it's anything but easy to get started with. So goal number two, remember? Make a complex feature discoverable. We want to do that in a simple way for Kubernetes so that you can get hooked on it, try it out. Feel, it, it should feel natural just to use it. Um, we're out of time, but I can continue <laughs> listing stuff, <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> so, bye. <laughs>